good evening. Welcome to Request Night at Old Time Baptist Church. Let's all stand up, grab a song book, and uh, you guys, for Brother Larry, hand up. What do you got? I'm sorry? 286. Nice. 286. What do we got here? <clears throat> all right. All right, we'll sing one verse and go right on to the next. Here we go, ready? Brightly beams our Father's mercy From His lighthouse evermore But to us He gives the keeping Of the lights along the shore Let the lower lights be burning Send a gleam across the wave some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may save. We'll get one over here. Any? All right. Yes. 521. 521. All right. That'll give those older folks back there a time to think. Amen. 521. What is this one? <clears throat> Uh-oh. All right, I'll give it a shot. I have good news to bring, and that is why I sing. All my joys with you I'll share. I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship and go sailing through the air. Oh, I'm going to take a trip in the good old gospel ship. I'm going far beyond the sky. Oh, I'm going to shout and sing until the heavens ring when I'm bidding this world goodbye. All right, we'll come over here. What do you got? Joey, go ahead. Which one? I love you, Lord. I love the Lord. How's it go? Well, he knows it. Nice. How about one in the hymn book so we all can follow along? <laughs> all right, we'll go, we'll go to Louie over there. Number nine? Number nine. What's number nine? I don't know. We'll find out. God can do anything but fail. Okay, we know this one. Da 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 da. Oh no, wait, wrong key. <laughs> God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. He can save, He can keep, He can cleanse, and He will. God can do anything but fail. He's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. God can do anything, anything, anything. God can do anything but fail. Anybody over here? No, no, no takers. There he is. 171. Number 171. Don't be shy, okay? If I don't know it, I won't I won't do anything. I'll just skip it. 171. As a volunteer, okay. A call for loyal soldiers comes to one and all. Soldiers for the conflict, will you heed the call? Will you answer quickly with a ready cheer? Will you be enlisted as a volunteer? A volunteer for Jesus, a soldier true. Others have enlisted, why not you? Jesus is the captain, we will never fear. Will you be enlisted as a volunteer? Okay, we'll take another one back here. All right, the back in the back there. Is that Mark? Justin. 244. You get it right? Okay, and I won't let you, we'll let you relax, okay? Come back. Hold the fort. Oh. All right, you got your Bible? Wave that answer back to heaven. We'll sing one verse here. 
Oh, my comrades, see the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signals still. With the answer back to heaven, by thy grace we will sing. So you got your, your Bibles all ready. I can't let you just all that work. Let's sing one more verse. All right, number four. Here we go. Ready? Fierce and long the battle rages, but our help is near. Onward comes our great commander. Cheer, my comrades, cheer. Woo! Hallelujah, amen. Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus, signal still. Who wave the answer back to heaven. By thy grace we will. Camp meeting breaking out there. My goodness. Good to be in church. Good to see everyone. Good to just sing the Lord's praises. You love Jesus tonight. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, open in a word of prayer. Let's have somebody else pray tonight. Let's see. Brother Paul Chesky, why don't you open us in a word of prayer? Amen. You may be seated. Teen activity, uh, Friday, May 30th, from 7 to 9 p.m. Nerf night here at the church. Please please bring a disc to share. Camp registra registration um, will be... Attention parents and campers, camp registration and all camp balances are due on Sunday, June 1st to Miss, Mrs. Erica B.A. All right, well, I got a card here from the Cobbs. It says, Dear Pastor Lou and old-time family, what a blessing to get a chance to see everyone again. We sure do miss your faces uh, while we were gone. I'm sorry, it's written in cursive, and it, it, everything kind of just runs together. So give me a second. <laughs> Thank you to each of you that keep up with us by phone calls, texts, and emails. You'll never know how much that encourages us. Thank you also to those who did little things for us, while we were home. The jams, uh, candy, dinners, visits, all of it was very much appreciated. It won't be long till camp meeting comes around. Many of you we won't be able to see again till then. We love each of you. Thank you for your friendship, your support, and your prayers. The cops. Victory Baptist Church, uh, 11th Annual Revival Meeting with Pastor Pat Burke. Uh, the last two days coming up, of the meeting, which is tomorrow and Friday. His services will begin at 7 each night. Installation service for Pastor Louis Argadano is on this Sunday, June 1st. Many of our area pastors are going to be joining us for a special service, and we have a great fellowship afterwards. Old Time Baptist Academy and Hope School graduation is Friday, June 6th at 7 p.m. And Miss Angela Nicotera is going to be doing our letter for us. I have a missionary letter from the Shields. The Lord has provided many opportunities to witness to people recently.
All right, well, let's pray for the offering. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for this opportunity to come to your house this evening, dear God. I pray that you bless the offering, bless the gift to the giver, and the preaching to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That's right. What am I doing? <laughs> Got to get the stick out and get the claw. All right, let's have our ushers come, and we'll uh, have the prayer sheets. We'll dismiss the threes and fours. Give me one of those, would you guys? All right, we have two different uh, prayer sheets tonight, and uh, you'll get a couple of different ones, or, or I should say some of you will get one, others will get the other one, and, and that's by design. Uh, because we want you to pray for different missionaries. Um, so some of you will have um, one list and some will have another. Um, I believe you have about 16 or so on your sheet. We want to pray for a couple other things. We want to pray for our troops tonight. Uh, those uh, We just had Memorial Day and, and those that have sacrificed and given their lives. But we want to pray for those that are serving. And uh, we also want to pray for a preacher, that preacher could attend... Sunday night. That is a specific prayer request that we have, and we want him to be able to make that. I know he wants to be here, but a lot of things have to happen, obviously, uh, his health and, and some good help and all of that to make that possible. So just pray for him. Pray for my mother. I know that's not an easy thing and all that she has to do. So just to keep that whole day in prayer. Uh, Brother Keenan will be with us all day Sunday, so uh, looking forward to that. And uh, we'll just take some time here and pray, all right?
All right. Um, you may remain seated. We'll sing a verse of number 43. Number 43 in your songbooks. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Okay, we'll take a few more requests here, just a few more. What do we got here? We got Brother Bruce. 34. Number 34. What do we got? <clears throat> Amen. <laughs> okay. I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadows or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worries in vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting could find in, in His great love. From our hearts safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Mrs. Budano. What was it? Four, six, four. Nice and pronunciated so I can hear it. <laughs> four, six, four. What is this here? <clears throat> All right. Amen. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be His helpers all the lives to bring? Who will live the, leave the world side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for him will go? By thy call of mercy, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side. Savior, we are thine. Alicia. 127. Number 127. Go ahead. Amen. <clears throat> oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of rain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed His grace on thee. And crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. On the fourth. Oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years. Thine alabaster cities gleam. Undimmed by human tears, America, America, God shed His grace on thee, and crown thy good with brotherhood from 
golden sea to shining seas. Amen. Mrs. Sager, and that'll be our last one. 395? 395. I read lips, too. Amen. Uh, amen. I have a song that Jesus gave me. It was sent from heaven above. There never was a sweeter melody. Tis a melody of love. We're going to hold it out. Ready? In my heart there rings a melody. There rings a melody. With heaven's harmony, oh, way down in my heart, there rings a melody, there rings a melody of love. Anybody leaving? We got college and career. We got. Do we got the kids' class tonight? Yes. Oh, they're gone. They're, everybody's good. So I'm the one that's behind the eight ball. Okay, we're gonna have a special, Miss Hannah. One of those days, you know. Amen. Bear with me. The birds up in the air know their creator. Nature sings an awesome song of praise. Even the heavens declare his glory. So I can stand before you and proclaim that I know him. Yes, I know him. I met him at the foot of Calvary. I know him, yes I know him, but best of all, he knows me. He's moving in this place right now, I feel him, I do believe he's standing in the arms he beckons to the weary. Come, I'll give you rest, my child. I've rested in his arms a million times or more, and every time he's held me tenderly. So I will stand and say to you, I know Stand with me and agree that I know him. Yes, I know him. I met him at the foot of Calvary. I know him. Yes, I know him. But best of all, he knows me. That I know him. Yes, I know him. I met him at the foot of Calvary. I know him. Yes, I know him. But best of all, he knows me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to hear good things. Uh, I heard things w went well on Sunday. I'm really glad to hear that. It's always uh, a burden on my heart anytime I'm away. I just want things to be all right. And uh, I'm glad that uh, 
It's just good to hear good things. I appreciate the song tonight. Um, I, you know, as Brother Chris Cheney says, uh, God's teeing it up. You know, he's, he's teeing it up. That's what he always says, Chris Cheney. Um, but uh, I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Um, I've got a lot to say tonight, and uh, I'm going to try to get it all in best I can. Um, as you turn to Hebrews chapter 4, put your finger there, and I think I'm going to have you turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Keep your finger in Hebrews chapter 4. We'll be back there in a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll look at verse 3. The Bible says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted. Notice the next phrase, from the simplicity that is in Christ. God's things are not, it's not that God's things are so complex. I mean, yes, His ways are high above our ways. We don't understand His ways. But God gave us a Bible. He wants us to know Him. He wants us to know His ways. And the devil is the one that causes confusion. He is the one that's causing confusion. He's the one whispering in the ear. He's the one starting that kind of trouble. And so uh, there's things, flip back to Hebrews chapter 4. I'd like to talk a little bit about entering into rest, entering into his rest. And, and so I'm going to start in Hebrews chapter 4. We'll look in James chapter 2 and we'll go to some other verses. Really what I'm speaking about tonight is eternal security. And uh, I want to just uh, have a word of prayer and then I, I will get into this, all right? Dear Lord, I thank you for today, and I pray that you just would, please, Lord, I beg you to help me tonight especially. I feel the subject is above me, God, and, and uh, there's no way that I can just uh, open up the Scriptures without your Holy Spirit power working in hearts and working in minds. Lord, I know what you've done in my heart. I know what you've taught me over the years. It's taken me, Lord, uh, just so many years to even get a grasp on some of these things just because of the confusion that the devil brings. And I pray that you would just help me. Maybe there would be a verse that I would read that would just resonate in somebody's heart tonight. And God, that's my goal. I want to be a help. I want to be a blessing. And Lord, I pray that you'd hide me behind the cross. Help me, Lord, not to say anything that I shouldn't say. Help me, Lord, to be, be straight on my doctrine. Help me, Lord, to represent you well. And God, I pray that you would just open our understanding tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to teach a little bit tonight. And when I teach, uh, when anyone teaches, that's, that's, I mean, we like to come to church and hear preaching and be entertained a little bit. And I'm going to try not to bore you, but I need you to pay attention. Because I know us. When we start talking about things like eternal security or a doctrine that we think we know about or familiar verses, we just... We go on autopilot. I need you to pay attention, all right? So uh, hang with me as we try to go through this, and uh, this will help you. This will help you help others. And, uh, and uh, let's just get started here in Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. So here, the book of Hebrews, now who's the book of Hebrews to? What's the name? There's the clue, all right? It's to the Jews, to those Hebrews, so we look at it primarily from that standpoint. Now, all Scripture is given by inspiration. It's profitable for doctrine. There's things that apply to us big time. But right away, it's, it's to the Jews. So that's the initial, uh, the initial premise that it's coming uh, at. Now, here Paul is talking to them. There's Jews that walk around, and, and the Jews are wearing their little hats, and they got their beards, and they're, they're praying, and they're doing all these rituals. And he's talking about entering into rest. He's talking about really uh, some things that will apply to us here in a moment. Look in verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Now, you can make a couple of different uh, relationships here. Paul is, is talking... Uh, to the saved, but he is talking to the Jews primarily. So it's preached to the Jews, it's preached to the Gentiles. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word, uh, but the word preached uh, did not profit them, 
not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. They're, they're excluded because they don't, they don't have faith, because they don't believe. The key word that the Bible brings up many times throughout the New Testament is believe. You must believe. You must believe in who He is. You must believe in Christ. Verse 3 says, For we which have believed, I want you to focus on that, those that have believed do enter into rest. As He said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So on one side we have those, and, and, and the devil wants this to be a very confusing thing. Um, to those especially who are maybe, um, how should I say, I'll put myself in this, in this category as, as second generation Christians or someone that's saved as a young person, uh, Many folks that are saved later in life, they have uh, a, a miraculous transformation where there was the Holy Spirit was not active in their heart and in their life, and they can go back to a place prior to salvation where they know that I've passed from death into life, and there's this drastic change, and I'll never forget that day. But the Bible teaches that even if we forget, He doesn't forget, and He knows. And the devil wants to confuse this issue one of the things that the devil is good at is keeping uh, Christians in a quagmire, just going around in circles like the children of Israel in the wilderness, and they're not accomplishing anything. Brother Jones always used to say, settle your salvation. Settle your salvation. And you can settle it based upon what it says in the Word of God. Not by our emotions, not by our feelings. But people that are uh, second-generation Christians, uh, people that... that um, maybe uh, have gotten away from the Lord. Sometimes they'll have trouble with their salvation. They'll question their salvation. Uh, people that have a hard time, Brother Marvin Smith uh, touched on it when he said uh, people that uh, maybe uh, are rejected, they just can't believe that God would accept them. A lot of times this happens with people that have been rejected. They maybe grew up in a, a divorced family or a divorced home, and they don't have a, a good father figure where they can say, hey, I'm accepted in the beloved, and believe that it's to them. Many times they believe it's for everyone else, but it's not for me. And, and even people that grow up in the church can feel that way. They can say, I know that God exists. I know that he's the Savior of the world. I believe in the Bible. I believe in all of these things, but I'm not sure that, it, that, it, that I've got it. I'm not sure he did it for me. And what it's saying here, it's just making, it's making a distinction between two people, two types of people. Over here we have those that believe. Those that say, I believe who he says he is. I believe he's the Savior of the world. I believe he's God. I believe, I believe, I believe. And over here he's saying, these are the ones that don't believe. These are the ones that say, that's not God. That's not Christ. I mean, that, that's, that's some man like the Pharisees that are going, you know, he, he made himself God. And, and these people clearly do not believe. Again, the simplicity that's in Christ. Do you believe or don't you believe? What side, put yourself, what side are you on? The devil will get you confused to where you're going, I'm not sure, you know, but it's very clear. Do you believe or don't you believe in who he is and, and what he said it was going to do? Um, let's move on. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Um, and, and, and so, uh, I guess I don't have time to get too much into verse 3, but I'll, I'll move into verse 4 here. God rests, and really, he is trying to get each and every one of us to be able to rest. I remember when I was struggling for years with my salvation. Now, as a young person, I was saved at 5 years old. I didn't struggle with that for years until I was probably about 12 years old. Then all of a sudden I got to a point where, man, I was starting to do wrong on purpose. I mean, on purpose. And God would convict me and I would quench the Holy Spirit. And I would do all these different things. And before you know it, man, the devil gets you spinning around, spinning around. And then am I even saved? And so uh, I fought that for a lot of years. But what, what God wants us to do is he wants us to be able to rest that we're saved, to have peace to know 
And it's not an, an emotional thing. Now, it, it will impact your emotions. But, but all I'm trying to get you to say, see in the Scriptures, just from a logical standpoint, he, he wants you to enter into rest. He wants you to cease from all of these, these outcroppings, these works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest... Remember what we said, some, some seem, should seem to come short of it. Verse 1. Um, verse 6, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in. Why do they not enter in? What's the next phrase? Because of what? Because of unbelief. Um, this means, I mean, again, th these, these people, these people that he's talking to, these are the Jews. Jews have to get saved too. And not all Jews go to heaven. You know, All dogs go to heaven. All Jews don't go to heaven. They're God's chosen people. But, but, but they, have to, they have to trust him too. And so, but, but those, there's those that enter into his rest, those that believe, and those that don't. Um, verse 7, again, he limiteth the certain day, saying, In David today, after so long a time, as it is said today, if... Ye will hear his voice. Harden not your heart. So there's the big if there. There's, there's that if. It's not that just it's automatic that, that, man, you're a Jew, you go to heaven. Or, or there's no automatic. It's, there's a big if there, that big little word. Um, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Uh, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. So to the Jew that is trying to work and to please God and have favor with God and get God to accept him, you know, he's saying, there's a rest for you. There's a rest if you would believe in Christ, if you would trust him, if you would put your faith in him. You could enter into rest, and you could cease from all of these works. And, and we can apply that even as we, we grow up in church, that, that there's a lot of people that are trying to get saved. They're trying to be repented enough. They're trying to have a certain feeling. They're trying, I mean, if, and, and, and I deal with so many people. And don't you think that you're the only person that has ever gone through this? And I'm trying to explain, you don't have to. Not everyone is in that quagmire, but there are many people that, that the devil will get them spinning around, spinning around, spinning around, confusing them, and God wants you to enter into rest. He wants you to cease from that. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to believe that, that he'll do what he says he's going to do, and you can trust him. And, you know, sometimes you just have to, it's not easy. I'm not saying that it's just an automatic thing that you just say, okay, we'll see this. There you go. Brother B.A., here's a snorkel. If you put it in your mouth and you put your face in the water, all you got to do is breathe. The air will come through, and you're going to be okay. But then you put your face in the water, and what happens? <laughs> you know, have you ever done that? Has anyone ever gone snorkeling? I mean, that's scary business. I just can't breathe underwater. That's not right. But, but we know it's true. We know it's right. And that's the way it is. The Scriptures give us... The instruction, the scriptures say, this is the way it is. And Christ wants you to rest. Hey, trust me. Trust me. But we've got to trust him. And, it's, it, and it, it may not be an emotional thing at first. But we've got to believe that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Verse 10. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That's the context of that verse. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So that's the context of that verse. The word of God will divide it. The word of God is a discerner. The word of God will say, "Hey, these are those that don't believe. These are those that believe, and these are those that don't believe." I mean, this is what you've got to do. This is what you've got to accept. This is, you know, how it's got to be. And and you're over here, or you're over here. And and it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, plain, really. Go to James, 
just by way of introduction, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna get into uh, some verses here, and I'm gonna throw a lot of Bible at you tonight. If you can stay with me, that's great. If not, um, you know, just listen up. But I want to spend some time here in James chapter two because James chapter two is a chapter that deals with works. Now Martin Luther, I mean, he did a he did some good things, but he didn't he didn't know what to do with the book of James. I mean, here's an Augustinian priest who was messed up on doctrine. He got one thing straight that it's it's not by works of righteousness, but he wanted to throw the book of James right out because it says here talks about works in James. And there is no contradiction. And I want you just to realize some things here in James chapter 2. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you a, a assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves? Are ye become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? For But if ye have despised the poor, do not rich men oppress you, and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy, that has showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. Let me stop there. He's going to start talking here about how works will, will prove your faith. Works will show you where you're at, really what you believe. Your works is going to show that. Here in verse 13, he's saying, For he that he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. I mean, he that shows no mercy is what he's saying. I mean, he's going to have no mercy. That judgment is going to be on him. Verse 14 asks a question here. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Can faith save him if he has not works? Now, most people, when they think of works, what do they think of? They think of working their way to heaven. We just read Hebrews chapter 4. Here is these Jews. They're trying to, in, in essence, work their way to heaven. They're trying to please God in the flesh. You can't please God in the flesh. There's nothing in us that, that is, is good. And so here, here uh, it, there's, there's that question uh, about works. Um, what doth the prophet, uh, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? I mean, what's, what's good is it to pray for someone, be ye warmed and filled? They're starving, and, and you say, I'm going to pray for you, brother. And there's a lot of Baptists that do that. But, you know, we're talking about if you really believe, if you really care, if you, then what do you do? You do something. Your works, I mean, what is inside will come out. It'll just be like a natural response. Um, and then, even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seeing thou hast faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, saith, Abraham believed God, 
and it was imputed to him unto, uh, imputed unto him for righteousness, as he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. What he's saying is that Abraham believed God, but it, it was more than just this, this foggy belief in who God is. I mean, you've heard the example of the guy walking the, the wheelbarrow on the, on the cable right across the falls. Do, do you believe that I can carry these bricks in this wheelbarrow and carry them across the falls on this, on this tightrope? I should be walking like this. You never walk like this on a tightrope. And, and what do they say? Oh, sure, we, you know, you can do it. Well, then get in the wheelbarrow, right? Salvation is what? Get in the wheelbarrow. I'm putting my trust in him. Abraham, I mean, he does some things. He believes, and so it causes him to act. That's where this works is connected. The next verse is Rahab. What does Rahab do? She believes, and what does she do? It causes her to do something. She puts her, she puts her, you know, her, 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 her life on the line, doesn't she? Noah does what? Noah doesn't just say, yeah, I believe God. He does what? He builds the ark. And then when God says, come into the ark, what does he do? He goes in. And that, that faith without works is dead. You can say, I believe that if I got in there, then, then I would be saved. But if you don't act upon it, really you don't believe. You know, you, you, you have to, you have to, Act upon it. And so faith without works is dead. So we'll look at the scriptures here and just talk about entering into rest. Um, a lot of things are based on feelings. Um, as I mentioned, one of the devil's devices is to keep you spinning, 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 spinning. Uh, a lot of times what happens even to good people and, and, uh, is, is they'll hear something in the preaching. They'll even hear somebody's testimony and somebody will relate what happened to them. They'll say, this is what happened to me. This is the way I felt. This is what I did. Somebody will get up and, and well-meaning, hey, they're just testifying about what God did in their life. But what I'm saying is that even preaching, the devil can use it against you. You wouldn't think that. But I'm telling you, I was raised in church. And, and the devil, I mean, as much as we try to pray him out of here, I mean... Some thoughts get come in. I don't know where they come in. Maybe we didn't pray enough or something, but they get in there. And some preacher will be preaching and say, hey, when I got saved, God took, you know, alcohol from me. I mean, I never, I never, you know, I can't understand about somebody that, that, that would drink alcohol after they were, they were saved. You know, as soon as I got saved, it was over for me. And that was, you know, the last time I ever took a drop. And so somebody's sitting there and they think, I got saved. And you know what? I had a drink of alcohol. Maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I, you know, maybe I didn't get it. I don't got what he's got. And I'm telling you, the devil will use that. But we can't go by experience. We've got to look at the scriptures and say, are we saved? I'm not saying everybody's saved. Hey, search it out. But you need to look at the scriptures and stop listening to what people are saying. Hey, if that's what happened to them, wonderful, great. But you know what? The worst things I've done in my life, I did after salvation. I was saved at five. So, you know, the devil will mess with your mind. Hey, so, so be careful. The devil will even use the Bible. You could be reading the Bible, and the devil will say something. When you're reading the Bible, I mean, didn't he do that to Jesus? The devil quoted the Bible, didn't he? Hey, it is written, right? Well, what did God do? Well, then we're not using the Bible because the devil's using it. No, he gave him the Bible right back. But so don't run from the Bible, but know that the devil will twist anything. He'll use, you know, he's right from the Garden of Eden, he was twisting the Bible, wasn't he? And he'll take something that's good. He'll take preaching that's good. I'm not saying the preaching's bad. I'm not saying the Bible's bad, but that devil's bad. And he'll start putting a spin on it. You better watch it. Um, remember the text. The serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity. It's simple. God's way is simple. He doesn't want you to doubt. He wants you to know. 
it should be very apparent. Either I'm rejecting, I should over here this side. This is the rejecting God side. This is the side that I'm not rejecting. I'm, I'm, I, I want the Lord. I was talking with somebody, me and my brother. There's my brother. We were talking about our two different testimonies, and uh, we were raised. I was saved. I got away from the Lord. My brother was not saved. And if you would have talked to us, two totally different situations. I, I would have never said. I don't believe, I, don't, I want God to be the Lord of my life. Was I struggling with sin? Yes. But God, He was the Lord of heaven. He was my Savior. And, and, and that was for sure. Why would you doubt your salvation? Because the devil will get and twist your mind up. Now Pete would say, hey, I don't want to hear the preaching. I'd plug my ears if I could. He's not saved, and he, you know, his, his testimony is totally different. But no matter what we went through and what we felt like, don't base your salvation on this. Base your salvation on what it says in this book. Um, but lest we should be corrupted, it's simple. We must first understand what salvation is and what God has done for those that are saved. Only then can we understand what we can never, uh, that we can never lose our salvation. We understand that it is through God's grace that we're saved. This is a familiar verse, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. What is grace? Grace, grace is, is God giving us what we do not deserve. You have to meditate upon that because, again, a lot of times the person that's raised in church the person that had a rough upbringing, the person that has this doubt, they're putting all of the weight of their salvation on them. And grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. Some unmerited favor is what grace is. Something we do not deserve. We could never merit salvation. And, see, and since you could never deserve salvation, God offers it freely. It is His free gift. We just read it there. And that not of yourselves, it is what? It is the gift of God. You cannot save yourself. I mean, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. You can't save yourself by good works. You can't save yourself by baptism. You can't save yourself by obeying the Ten Commandments, coming to church. Now, I, you, Brother Lou, I know that. Well, well, why is it that we get twisted up in our thinking? Because we have to realize, I mean, hang with me on this. I mean, you can't save yourself. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. There's nothing that we can do to get salvation as far as our part. It's totally something that, that God has to do. Now, we have to believe. There's those that believe. There's those that reject God, right? But, but we have to understand right at its roots, right in the beginning, that it's, it's, it's a work of grace. Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. And so since, since good works can do nothing to save us, evil works... Can, can do nothing to, to lose that salvation. I mean, Brother Marvin Smith hit it, the nail on the head. You know, here is where we, we get saved and we think, okay, God has accepted me. But then I don't read my Bible, so I, I feel like I'm not accepted. I don't go to church, so I feel like, you know, I'm down here. And then I, I'm, 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 I'm sheepishly running away from God because, because I don't think I'm accepted. Hey, He accepted you. He loved you when you could do nothing. There's nothing that you could do to get yourself to heaven. He gave you grace, which is something you do not deserve. He put something towards you that you don't deserve. And, 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 that, and that's the way it is even after. Um, since good works can do nothing to save, evil works can do nothing to destroy or reverse salvation. But there's many people that have a problem with that. They question that in their mind. If your evil works cause you to lose your salvation, think about this. If evil works cause you to lose your salvation, then your good works would cause you to earn it back, right? If I lose my salvation, well, then i got to do something to earn it back. And then I'm working my way to heaven. But you just, you just told me that you, you, know, you can't work your way to heaven. Well, I know that. But somehow after salvation, we, we get all twisted up. And it, and it has nothing to do with that. We could never earn it. 
We can't earn it after. And you're not, by the, by the way, you're not looking at it with a big enough magnifying glass either, microscope. Because just because we get saved, hey man, we're sinning the first few days, the first minutes after we get saved. Well, I didn't, I didn't drink, I didn't smoke, I didn't do drugs. But you know what? Was there any sin in you? Did you have a wrong thought? So where are you not saved? Where did you lose it? When you had the wrong thought? I mean, how far down that line do you go before where you say, you know, I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved, and then when I do something really bad, I'm not saved. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. Once you're saved, it's, it's forever. You could never get it on your own. You could never keep it. And Dad taught us that, but you know, I didn't understand all of that until I really was able to look at the Scriptures, and God had to open those things up for my, you know, to, to me personally. Um, you are saved in the first place in spite of your sins. So you cannot be lost because of your sins. We're saved in spite of our sins, aren't we? Didn't He come and die for us? I mean, while we were yet sinners, what? He, he loved us. He died for us. And so it, it, it really doesn't have to do, maybe it's that Catholic mentality or whatever is in us. We've been twisted up. We think it has to do with the good things that we do, and it does not. The only way to be lost would be for God's grace to be insufficient. That God said He was going to do something, and He didn't do it. He extended unmerited favor, but it wasn't good enough to cover everything. And you know, He is perfect, and He is higher than the heaven, and hey, if, 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 if the grace is coming from Him, it's good enough. And so, do you have confidence in Him? Hey, and if someone would ask me, do you have confidence in God? I would say, yes, I have confidence in God. But I would think, I don't know about me. Maybe I messed it up. Maybe I didn't read the fine print. Maybe, maybe I wasn't repentant enough. Maybe I didn't come down to the altar and, and, and do it just right or kneel a certain way or jump out on the first verse. I came on the second, you know. And it's all on me, 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 what I'm doing. And it, it has nothing to do with, with me. It has all to do with Him. If grace is the basis of salvation, then faith is the method of salvation. Contrary to popular belief, you're not saved by having enough faith for God to accept you. You know, I, 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 have, I, I have all this faith, and I'm, I have enough faith to trust in God, and, and God says, okay, you've got it now. You've, saved, you, you, you've got the faith to do it. You know, if we had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, we could do what? Move mountains. And how many of us are moving mountains? It's not by our faith that we're getting to heaven. I mean, there's all these, you know, southern guys that talk about praying through and all this stuff. A lot of emphasis is placed on the individual. And it's not, it's the, the, the emphasis should be on God. He is the one, and it's really by His faith. Now, I'm not saying that just, you know, uh, like the Calvinist believes that you just have irresistible grace and that, you know, it's just going to happen. I'm not saying that. You have to choose the Lord. You can, the Bible's clear, you can choose Him or you can reject Him. But it's, it's not by us conjuring up this great faith. You must simply believe. And your faith is completed by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. I mean, it is not, it is not in us. It's, it's not by works. It's not by really our faith. You're saved through faith, but that faith is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. This does not mean that we're saved apart from a decision to believe or accept Christ. Galatians 2.16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we uh, have believed in Jesus Christ, and we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now, we get it that by, no, by the works of the law shall no man be justified. We get that, but we seem to miss that it's the faith, that it's Christ's faith, that, that by, by the faith of Jesus Christ, being justified by the faith of Christ. Romans, uh, turn to Romans 3.22. I want you to see this verse. Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. It's by His faith. It's not by our faith. Romans 3.22. The Bible says, 
even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of who? Jesus Christ. Unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. It's unto all. It's upon all them that believe. Again, there's that word again. Do you believe? Or do you are, are you one that says, I don't believe? I don't believe in Christ. I don't believe in your God. I don't believe in the God of the Bible. I, you know, he has no power to save. Or I do believe that he is God. And I do believe that he has the power to save. And I believe so much that I'm going to put my trust in him. And I'm going to let go of everything else that I'm trusting in. Mohammed and, you know, my baptism and everything else. I'm putting my trust in here. I want to enter into rest. I want to be able to sit there and say, he is keeping, he is, you know, I have put my faith in him and he's got it. And man, if, if, if I go to hell, it's because he lost it or he let it go or I slipped out of his hand. And I'm telling you, you can't do that, but we want to be able to enter into rest. And, and the Bible's clear. It's unto all. All men can be saved. God died for them all, but it's upon all them that believe, and there's no difference. It's offered unto everyone, but it is unto all them that believe. The person in whom you place your faith determines your eternal destiny. Again, the simplicity that's in Christ. The person that you put your faith in, that's, that's I mean, who are you putting your faith in to get you to heaven? Are you putting your faith in your good works? Sometimes I'll talk to somebody, I'll say, are you putting your faith in your good works to save you? Now, there's some people that have never really realized that they're a sinner, that their sins are taking them to heaven. They don't think they're a bad person. You know, they're, you could see that they don't, they don't understand what the Bible is teaching. But, but there's many people that, that if you talk to them, yes, I'm a sinner. And then you, you talk to them and you say, are you trusting in, in, in your baptism? Your, you go through the list and they go, no, I'm not trusting. I'm looking for Christ to, to save me. I'm putting my trust in him. And, and so there's no, there's no you know, in between. Do you understand what I'm saying? Either you're saved or you're not. There's, there's no middle ground. Either you believe or you don't. Um, and I'm trying to make it simple for you to understand. I'm just trying to let the, hopefully the scriptures can unlock some of these things in your mind. Um, although you must believe in Jesus, the perfect faith that provides for you a perfect salvation is the faith of Jesus Christ. And we see that in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Um, and why don't you take your Bibles and turn there. I'm going to have you turn to just a few more verses. Um, I've got a little bit more to say, but I want you to see these things. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. This is important. I know, uh, I know we'd all love to have uh, you know, a, a big preaching message, but man, we need to be able to understand some of these things. And you need to understand these things. You need to be able to share these, with other, this, these things with other people. 2 Timothy 2.13 um, says, If we believe not... Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. I mean, so if Christ's faith is faulty, then we're in trouble. But, you know, I mean, he, he is the one that, that is keeping us. I mean, even if we don't believe, I mean, if, if we put our trust in him and we forget about our salvation, we go half out of our mind, we get dementia. I mean, he abides faithful. I mean, you can't lose it once, once Christ has given it to you. And that's very clear in the Scriptures. Um, so we talk about grace. We talk about his faith. Let's talk a little bit about righteousness. Um, the Bible uses this word imputed righteousness. Really, that's righteousness from an outside source. We don't have righteousness in ourselves, but he imputes righteousness to us, uh, those that believe, those that have accepted Christ. Um, and, you know, the verse there, look in Galatians 3.13, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, talk about His grace, it's sufficient, His faith, it's Christ's faith, and then His righteousness. The Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. I mean, I traded rags for His robes. He traded my place. He took my place on the cross. That's what happened. That's the transaction 
that was made. So how can I lose it? How can he come and impute righteous to me and, and, and do the switcheroo, take my place, I get robes of righteousness, you know, my rags are lifted, and then, then I say, oh, I'm going to somehow mess this up. I could, never, I could never get it. I could never earn it. I could never, you know, I never deserved it. I asked him to save me, and he did that, and that transaction was made. I mean, he was a curse for us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, I'll just read you this verse. Listen, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He imputes to us his righteousness. It's his righteousness. And, and there's that transaction that's made. When you're saved, you're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. God sees the Son. That, that means that there, there'll never be a day that, that the Christian, those that have believed, those who have accepted Christ, that will ever stand before God in our own righteousness and and in our own robes, our own rags. We'll never stand there because when we have accepted Christ, that transaction is made, and He sees God. He sees Christ. God sees you know the blood of Jesus Christ, and and so we'll never stand there alone. That ought to encourage your heart because this is what He wants for you. He wants you to enter into His rest. He wants you to understand. These things. Um, let me read you one other verse. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. We're complete in him. In Christ, the interesting study to do is every time the word in Christ comes up, you know, that applies to those that are saved. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. That would clear up a lot of the doctrinal problems if we understood what happens in Christ. And, and if we would just realize that those verses apply to us. Um, you cannot lose your salvation because it's not based on your righteousness. Your righteousness was never a determining factor to begin with. Next, Christ's pardon would have to be removed. Ephesians 1 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. You think about that. There's never been a pardon. I mean, there's never been a presidential pardon. There's never been a pardon by any governor that has been greater than what Christ has done for us. God has pardoned us. He's done it because of Christ's righteousness, because of his grace. And and, and he has said, You're pardoned. All of these sins, we came to Him, no matter what age you were at, you could be 50 years old, you came to Him and you said, Lord, I'm laying it at Your feet. And He said, I'm pardoning you. There's enough, you know, enough forgiveness, another, enough you know, just cleansing power in one drop of my blood. I'm pardoning you. And He's pardoned us. And then we think we, we did this one little thing, and then that's all undone. I mean, you can't undo His pardon. He has pardoned you. He'd have to go back on his word. He's not, he's not an Indian giver. He doesn't make, you know, one day he decides to do this, and then the next day he goes, oh, no. You know, we're not doing that. He pardoned us, and that's what the Scriptures say. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Remember, that's that unmerited favor. Um, we have been pardoned. To lose your salvation, you'd have to get the Father to fail in His commitment. For a Second Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. We have committed, those of us who have believed on Christ, those of us who have said, you know, God, I want your salvation. I believe in who you, you know, say you are. Thank you for opening up my eyes to realize that there is a God in heaven. Christ did die on the cross. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. Take me to heaven when I die. Put my trust in you. I mean, to, to those of us that that has happened, um, there's a commitment that's been made by Christ. Uh, Brother Massa, while we were away, he preached a message that was really, really good. 
He talked about the Abrahamic covenant. He talked about how there's covenants in the Bible that, uh, you know, when one person does one thing, then the other person has to do their part. It's like a, you know, a little contract. You know, God said to uh, the Israelites, if you do this, I'll do this, right? If you do this, I'll do that. But then he talks about the Abrahamic covenant where he says, Abraham, then they divide, they divide the, the, the lamb and, and the old uh, Middle Eastern way was that the two parties would walk through the divided beast and in the Middle East, that was a pact for, I mean, to the death. I mean, they made a covenant together, both, both parties. And if you kept your side, this one would have to keep this side and, and, and so forth. But uh, he, Brother Massa preached about how when Abraham was there and, and that was divided, God went through alone into through that divided be, that divided beast. And so the covenant was completely on him. It, he said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. You, uh, you, the, you're going to be like the sands of the sea. And, and it wasn't that, it, that Abraham had to keep up his end of the bargain. Now, there was other things that he told Abraham. If you do this, I'll do this. And right on so forth, right on down through the kings. There was all these different things. If you do this, I'll do that. But in that particular place, he said, I'm going to do this. And and I don't, I don't mess up. I don't, I don't go back on my word. It's going to happen. You're going to be like the stars of the, of the sky and, and all of this. And so he went and, and taught that. But I'm trying to get you to understand, when it comes to salvation, it's that way. He died on the cross. He made a covenant. He made a commitment to us. He said, this is what I'm going to do. And it has nothing to do with if we keep up our end of the bargain. We could never keep up our end of the bargain. He said, I'm going to do this. I've made a commitment to you. And if you would come to me, I'll save you. And that's what that's that's our God, and that's the way He works. Um, I'm persuaded that He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Philippians 1:6 uh, says, "Being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it." until the day of Jesus Christ. It's a promise from God. Again, something that God cannot lie. He has made these commitments. He has made you know, these promises. Um, you cannot become lost by failing in your commitment to Christ. Again, because the, the, your salvation is based on His commitment to, to you, not the other way around. Your salvation is based on what God said He would do, not, not us being committed to Him. Lord, I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. And then we turn back. So now we're not saved. No. He's said that I'm, I'm committed to you. I, I will pardon you. I will save you. And, and, you know, once that transaction is made, there's no turning back. Um, and praise the Lord for that. We're adopted. Um, you know, and you think about that. I mean, that is a legal thing that happens. We have a lawyer here. An adoption, that's a pretty legal... I mean, it costs a lot of money to carry it on an adoption. And he has adopted us. Those that have come to him, those that have said, you're, Lord, you're my Lord and my Master. Those of us that, that have done that, an adoption has taken place. And there's no reverse in that. I like when, the, when they say, you know, he put you in his hand. You know, he pulled you out of the miry clay, put you there like that. I mean, and... And I like that message that Brother Jenkins preaches about how his hand spans the heavens. And he's talking about the universe. That's pretty big out there. But, you know, you can't jump out of a hand that's that big. You couldn't put yourself in that hand, and you ain't jumping out of that hand. And you're secure in Christ. Um, you cannot uh, become lost by failing in your commitment to Christ because your salvation is based on his commitment to you. Um, you're adopted. And then we're sealed. The Holy Spirit, you know, He's not your sealer. He's your seal. He's your seal. Once you become saved, He puts a seal on there. When I used to drive uh, years ago, over 20 years ago now, I was used to drive every uh, weekend, I would drive on Saturday up to the Toronto Pearson Airport. Pretty crazy, you know, the stories. Here I was a 16-year-old kid. I was the youngest postal carrier in western New York. And they would put me through the, the uh, 
the truck lanes. And I'm telling you, you go through that Canadian border, and I can only imagine what they thought. Here's this 16-year-old kid driving in the truck lanes. I had a, I didn't have a like a semi, but I had a big box truck, and I would take first-class mail from from the uh, post office on William Street, and I would take it all the way up to the Toronto Pearson Airport. And so I would go through those truck lanes, and if you've ever crossed the border, I mean, they grill you with questions: Where are you going? What's your name? Where are you born? You know, what are you carrying? And I'm telling you, the truck lanes, they put all the bad actors over there because that's where the big stuff comes through. So the meanest, nastiest custom border patrol agents are in the truck lanes. And here I'd come through as a 16-year-old kid, and he would say, where are you going? And I remember the first couple times I was there, I, I mean, I barely knew even how to get up to the Toronto Pearson Airport, and he's asked me, what, what place and what's the name of the street and where do you go and who do you talk to? And I didn't know names, and I'm going, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he asked me, and I think about it now, man, he asked me some really basic questions, and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I just go up there. I go up to this door. I drop the stuff off. And, you know, I mean, <laughs> and, I mean, it must have sounded really bad. But you know what? He says, what are you carrying? I know that. I'm, I'm carrying mail. And I've got a seal on the back. What kind of a seal? A postal seal. Let me see it. Pull up so I can see it. Well, he'd pull up, and they, they put this seal, and they clip it on the back of your truck. Man, when them customs agents see that postal seal, you're good. Just drive on through. You know, because it's sealed. And that's the way it is with salvation. God puts that Holy Spirit seal on you. I mean, you can't take it off. It's there, you know, and you're sealed to the day of redemption. And that's something that happens at Supernatural. God does that. Um, yes, make sure you're saved. I wrote that in my notes. I'm not trying to preach anybody into salvation. If, if you've not accepted Christ, if you've rejected Christ, then, then, then get saved. But look at what the Scriptures say and, and claim those verses for yourself. God loves you. He's not willing that any should perish. If He's not willing that any should perish, why would you think that he's trying to make this really difficult? The, most di the worst thing in the world is when you're saved, when, when you know, you have, uh, you know, some, some seem like they've not entered into that rest, and you're trying to get saved, and you're already saved, and you can't get saved again. I mean, that's the most miserable thing in the world. And he's saying, I want you to enter into rest. I want you just to accept me. Um, remember faith. And belief causes action. If you really believe, then, then you'll do something. You will get saved. Uh, and, and if you've already gotten saved, then, then you'll enter into rest and cease from those works. Cease from trying. Cease from the peace of God came back into my heart when I realized there ain't nothing I can do. I was just so at my wit's end. I, maybe I'm not repentant enough. Maybe I you know, didn't do this enough. And, and, and I finally just said, I can't take it anymore. And then it was like, all of a sudden, then the peace started coming and some of those emotions. But it's not based on emotions. One thing that will help you is get up in the morning and say, you know, say, God, you're my Lord, my master. I mean, you get up in the morning and you confess God as your Lord and your master. I mean, that will change the way you think. And then all of a sudden, when you just read a verse, you know, you'll say, I confess him as my Lord, my master. And, 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 and you'll realize that this is the side I'm on. I'm not on this side. I'm reading all these verses about this one that didn't believe and this one that rejected and this one that hates God. Man, I'm not over there. I'm over here. And if I'm over here in Christ, then all of these things apply to me. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, you know, I think of, uh, you know, I thought of the, the snorkel. I mean, we, it's, it's really like, Someone that's got a life preserver on. When you're saved, you get the life preserver on. You know, and, and you ever take a kid and you put him in the pool, and he's got the life preserver on, and you know, he hasn't, he hasn't, uh, he, he really ain't a good swimmer, and he, he's afraid he's going to drown. You know, what does he do when he start letting go of him? Man, he starts freaking out. Freaking out. But you know what? Is he going to drown? I mean, it, it don't matter if he freaks out. It don't matter if he's calm. He ain't going to drown. And that's the way it is with salvation. Now, some people, I mean, 
it's, this is not something that just is automatic. You're going to come down to the altar tonight, and you're just going to say, God, I, I know I need to trust in you, and I see what it says in the Scriptures, but I'm not saying it's going to be an automatic. You're not going to just come in and, and just, you know, praise the Lord if that does happen. Sometimes that happens. You know, you let the kid go, and he goes, huh, I'm okay. You know, and that's wonderful if that happens. Hey, you're over the shock. Now we can have some fun in the pool, you know. Now we can get something done. And that's what God wants for you. He wants you to enter into that rest. But some of you, hey, I get it. You're, you're going to be bobbing. You're going to be hanging. You're going to be, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be kicking like a maniac until you finally start going, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. You're my Master. But I'm telling you, if you just, if you just hang with it, you know, and just you know, allow God to do some things and show you some things and open them scriptures to you, boy, you know, you'll gain a little bit more confidence. You'll start realizing, man, he really does love me. He really does care for me. He's not going to let me slip. He's not going to let me drown. And before you know it, hey, I'm doing fine. I'm good. Now we can get something done. And that's what we want. We want to be able to enter into rest. Let's all stand. We'll have a verse of invitation. I have a feeling, you know, I, I, I talk to numbers of people. I, I disciple people. I talk with people in counseling. I, I know my own life growing up in church. I know a, young, a lot of young kids here growing up in church. I know that there's many people that struggle with salvation. Am I saved? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm asking you to check your heart. Maybe sin has crept in and that's what's causing doubt. But God doesn't want you to question. Hey, if you're not right with God, get right with God. But if the devil's trying to you know, do a dipsy doodle on you, just get some things straight. Maybe you know some people that are struggling, and you want to be a help, and you want to be a blessing to them. Come and pray and ask the Lord and say, Lord, help me to be a blessing to them. Let's just uh, follow the Lord tonight and uh, just obey the Lord and, and take the invitation time if you'd like to do whatever Lord lay on your heart as we sing. Number 267, number 267. I know not why God's wondrous grace To me He hath made known Nor why unworthy Thy Christ in love redeemed me for his own but i know whom i have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which i've committed Unto him against that day. I know not how this saving faith to me he did in part, nor how believing in his word wrought peace within my heart but i know whom i have believed in and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which i've committed unto him against that day I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing man of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in Him. But I know whom I have believed in And am persuaded that he is able To keep that which I created Unto him against that day 
Oh, yes. Thank you, Jesse. I do need to meet with the staff uh, quickly. We'll meet in five minutes in Preacher's office. I just have, we got to get some questions settled on some building things. And um, I was going to try to wait for a meeting, but it's a week and a half away, and I got to get some answers. At least need to get some help, direction. I would like to be able to pick your brains a little bit. Okay, so meet with the Sounds of Praise first with Pete. Are you going to have to practice, or are you just meeting with him? I don't think we'll be real long. I hope not. All right, let's let's staff. We'll try to get in there quick, and then we'll cut loose as quick as we can. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, I'm thankful for uh, just uh, the simplicity that's found in your word. Thank you for what you've done in my heart. Lord, I know the, the, the misery that this can bring if somebody doesn't have, uh, Lord, their eternal destiny secure. Help us. Help us to be able to, Lord, uh, see those scriptures. Lord, we read the verse about how that, that Bible is a discerner, and it, it, it's a divider. And, Lord, I pray that we'd be able to just see what side we're on and so that we could get that thing settled. Help us in our emotions. We're emotional, and there's a lot of times we just don't feel, we just don't feel right. But, God, I pray that we would our confidence would not be in that. It would be in your word, just plain truth, the simplicity that's found in Christ. And, God, may we, we be able to go in confidence. Help us, Lord, to enter into rest and just be able to, Lord, rest in that where our eternal destiny is secure, that we might be able to serve you, that we might be able to free, free to just do something for you, God, and have that confidence that you will answer our prayer. Come boldly to the throne of grace, which is also the context there. And, Lord, I pray you just bless our folks. Help us to grow in grace. In Jesus' name, amen.